So welcome to this webinar today. Uh, my name is Kelly Toops and I'm with Old Ways. Old Ways is a nonprofit nutrition education organization that inspires people to embrace the healthy and sustainable joys of the old ways of eating. And we're really excited to have our friends um, from the peanut board here to talk about uh, early infant feeding. And we have uh, plenty of other webinars on the Old Ways website as well. And I would like to just take a minute to remind everyone that yes, this webinar is being recorded. And yes, we will share the recording and the slides with you. Um, all attendees will get an email with the slides, the recording, and their CPEU certificate within one week. Um, and then if you have any questions throughout this presentation, we'll be happy to uh, answer as many as we can at the end. So if you could please type them into the chat box rather than the Q&A, um, we'll go through the chat box at the end and see if we can answer your questions. So with that, I will hand it over to Jada Linton. Hello everyone, my name is Jada Linton and I am a registered dietitian nutritionist with the National Peanut Board. At the National Peanut Board, we work for America's peanut farmers and their families, and we help to improve the economic condition of the peanut farmers and their families through compelling promotion and groundbreaking research. And we also educate consumers and culinary professionals about the flavor, quality, and nutritional benefits of USA grown peanuts. Today, we have an amazing webinar planned for you. Recent research has changed the recommendations for feeding infants, and we are here to give you that updated information. In this session, our wonderful speakers will walk you through the latest research and guidelines on preventing food allergies. First, I will give a brief introduction to our speakers, review disclosures and objectives, and then I will hand it over to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Sherry Coleman Collins. She is a registered dietitian nutritionist licensed in Georgia and based in Metro Atlanta. Her areas of practice include nutrition communications, food allergies, digestive wellness, and culinary nutrition. As a communicator, Sherry is a sought after speaker and has presented at professional and consumer conferences across the country. Sherry has published dozens of articles in a variety of print and online publications and serves as an expert to the media. With a particular interest and expertise in food allergies and digestive health, her professional accomplishments include developing the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Certificate of Training in Food Allergies and authoring the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics practice paper, The Role of the RDN in Food Allergy Diagnosis and Management. Sherry serves as a consultant for National Peanut Board. Our second speaker is Melina Linkus Malkani. She is a licensed registered dietitian nutritionist author of Simple and Safe Baby-Led Weaning and trusted nutrition expert in hundreds of local and national media outlets, including US News and World Report, Sirius XM Doctor Radio, Newsweek, Reader's Digest, Insider, HuffPost, CNN, Well Plus Good, The Healthy and Food Network. She owns a nutrition lifestyle company in private practice, www.melinamalkani.com, geared towards moms, babies, and kids, and dedicated to providing caregivers with tools, kid-friendly recipes, and programs that make it easier to feed the entire family a mostly plant-based, nutrient-dense whole food diet that they will actually eat. She is a former national media spokesperson for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the director of Nutrition at Rejuvenon, a personalized digital wellness and telemedicine platform. Melina completed her undergraduate degrees at Northwestern University and master's degree in clinical nutrition at New York University. A New York-based single mom of three young girls, Melina loves being active, running around with her kids, cooking, and making music. You can find her hanging out on Instagram at healthy, period mom, period healthy, period kids. Next slide. 
here are the disclosures for this presentation. You can briefly read over them. Next slide. And in this session, the speakers will walk attendees through latest research and guidelines on preventing food allergies. Here are the objectives. And in addition to the new category of, of grocery products, food allergy prevention, foods for baby and toddlers, and a dis discussion on easy ways to introduce common allergens to infants safely will be explored today. And now I will hand it over to our first speaker, Sherry Coleman Collins. All right, thank you so much, Jada, and welcome everyone. I am thrilled at the number of people who signed up for this webinar. We are so excited to share this information and to get us started, I have a poll question for you. It's gonna pop up here in just a minute, um, just to get your, your thinking cap on, to get us um, into the mood of discussing these um, very this very important topic. So the question is, what percent of children have IgE mediated food allergies? Is it 10%, six to 8%, 25% or around 2%. If you'll make your selection, this is a good place to start because what we find is that many people um, think they know a lot about food allergies or have an idea of, of food allergies, how many people are infected. And, and, and sometimes um, people don't quite know what they think they know. So I'm interested to know what you guys think um, as you take a guess on this. The results will show up here in just a minute if you'll make your selection quickly. And many thanks to Kelly for running our polls today. Helpful to have another set of hands. All right, so it looks like 45% of you think six to 8%, 24% think 10%, 10% think around 25%, and 21% say around 2%. So very good, thank you for participating. Well, let's dive in. Here are some fast facts about food allergies. And those of you who said six to 8%, you were right, good job. Um, you may have seen me present before, you may have seen this information somewhere else. The reality is that when it comes to pre prevalence of food allergies, it's very difficult to say exactly how many people have food allergies. All of the data that we have is self-reported and we know that when people self-report a condition, whether it's food allergies or something else, sometimes they over-report that. Um, it's important to know though that this is the best estimate we have. In a study that was published, I think the uh, in late 2019, um, actually showed that maybe as many as 10.8% of adults have a food allergy or at least they report having a food allergy and they have convincing symptoms. So food allergies um, affect a significant number of the population, perhaps not as much as as many people think. Your numbers don't reflect necessarily what I see when I ask this question among consumers. A lot of times I'll hear 20 to 25% is the prevalent number. So many of you guys are very aware of this issue and that's awesome. We know that food allergies are costly. They cost a lot in the way of, of money um, because of special foods that are required sometimes. They cost a lot in healthcare, um, and they certainly have a very high cost so psychosocially. They cause a lot of anxiety for families and individuals, and that's something that I think sometimes people forget to include in the cost. There's also a lot of confusion around food allergies. There are many other kinds of reactions that can look like a food allergy, but aren't actually a food allergy. Other types of adverse reactions like intolerances or even food, foodborne illness. Sometimes people will have a reaction because of a foodborne illness and they think that they have an allergy to that food. So there's some overestimation of prevalence based on confusion around the symptoms. There's also some confusion because of diagnosis and we may talk a little bit about that if we have time. Because because of the confusion, it can actually impact those with food allergies negatively because it can increase um, issues around empathy. So sometimes people don't believe food allergies are real because they may have heard from someone who said they had a food allergy who doesn't actually um, have a food allergy. Uh, sometimes there are issues around schools and bans and trying to come to solutions that make sense and it can create some anxiety. But what we know is that prevention at this point is the best thing that we have in order to affect the future of those um, who perhaps are at risk for developing a food allergy. So what is a food allergy? Just a moment to get us all on the same page. When I'm talking about a food allergy, as I mentioned, there are lots of things that, that can look like a food allergy but might not actually be a food allergy. I'm talking about an IgE-mediated reaction. So this is an immune-mediated reaction that happens very quickly, usually within minutes. It can take up to two hours, but it usually happens more quickly than that, and it happens every time the food is eaten. 
sensitization does not necessarily mean um, that someone has a true allergy. So many people will have blood or skin tests um, if they think they have a food allergy and they may be positive for one or more foods, but if they have no symptoms when they eat that food, even in the case of a positive blood or a skin test, they don't necessarily have a true food allergy. You have to have symptoms plus sensitization in order to equal a true food allergy. These are some of the signs and symptoms that can happen when someone has a food allergy. It's really important to recognize that um, it can impact any organ system. Most often the reactions that happen have to do with um, the GI symptoms or GI system. So maybe some itching and swelling that starts in the mouth, some uh, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea is not uh, totally uncommon. Uh, hives are actually pretty common, but don't happen with every reaction. And then people who have severe reactions can have lung involvement, so difficulty breathing, and heart involvement, including uh, hypotension. And these are very severe reactions that can um, require epinephrine. Epinephrine is actually the only uh, approved treatment for anaphylaxis. So I share this with you just to sort of get everybody on the same page about what we're talking about. We're not talking about intolerances, we're talking about true food allergies. These are the big eight. You're probably familiar with these foods, milk, eggs, peanuts, shellfish, uh, finfish, uh, wheat, soy. These foods cause about 90% of food allergy reactions. There is a ninth allergen that's not included here. You've probably heard a lot about it if you follow food allergies in the news and that's sesame. We're seeing some movement to adding sesame as the ninth most common food allergen. At the moment, it's not included in the labeling laws, but I think that we may see that change in the coming year. All right, so let's take another poll. I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you guys think on this next question, which Kelly will pop up for us. When should potential allergens be introduced to babies? Now you might know this information or you might not. So what do you think after 12 months, at around six months, but not before four months? Babies should not be fed potential allergens. That's one that, that you might consider, or it depends on the allergen. Make your vote and we'll take just a minute. All right, at around six months, but not before four months is the number one answer. You guys are so smart. So let's move on to the content and, and talk about the evolution of infant nutrition needs. So we know that when a baby is born, basically at the very beginning of life, right, they're just learning to master suck, swallow, breathe, right? And the primary source of nutrition is breast milk, might be formula if mom chooses not to breast, breastfeed or can't breastfeed for some reason. And of course, in infancy, it is now recommended that for breastfed babies, exclusively breastfed babies should be given vitamin D. It's pretty straightforward, usually pretty simple, right? Some babies have issues with formula, some babies have issues with breast milk, but for the most part, this is the way it goes, right? Pretty straightforward, it isn't complicated. But at around six months, we begin to, to need something more, right? We begin to see that baby is starting to sit up and express some interest in feeding. And there's an opportunity for increasing exposure to new foods. And that's where complementary feeding really comes in. At this point, you know, baby's needs have changed a little bit. They may need some iron, more iron rich foods. We wanna continue vitamin D, but in general, we're starting to expand the baby's palate and we're feeding for a number of different reasons, not the least of which is developing these developmental milestones. And I think Melina is gonna talk a little bit more about this. So I'm not gonna go too much into it. I just want us to think Think about the transition that happens throughout that first year. And then as we get into toddler nutrition, and we're not going to talk about this too much today, but gosh, this is such a fun age, but can be a really challenging age to feed kids, right? Because they're a lot more um, autonomous. They're moving around. They're feeding themselves or not feeding themselves. They have very strong opinions on what they do and don't want to eat. And it can be a lot of fun, but it can also be a real challenge for moms and for dads. What we have learned now through the research is that there is a critical window during which introduction really makes a huge difference when it comes to allergy prevention. And so now I'm gonna walk you through several key studies that have helped change the way that we feed babies. But before I get into that, I wanna give a little bit more of a deep dive into thinking about what we know about the immune system. You know, I think at one time there was a very limited idea of what the immune system was like. You know, 
what we understand about human health is changing all the time. We know now that the immune system is really all over the body, but it's it's centered primarily in the GI and in the skin. This is a, these are the places where we see when it comes to food allergies anyway, anyway the, the interaction between proteins and the immune system happens primarily starting with the skin and then including the gut. And this is where our thinking has changed and shifted um, in huge, huge ways. We also know that there's a significant role for the microbiome and we're learning more and more about this. And I, I'm just sharing this with you as a bit of a teaser because the research is evolving and there's so much we don't know. But what we do know is that there is a difference between the microbiome in, in children who have food allergies or adults who have food allergies and those who don't. So much like other kinds of conditions where we're seeing differences and shifts in the microbiome, we don't exactly understand them all. We don't exactly know all of the things that influence it, but we know that there are a lot of things that can influence it. And one of the things that is controllable that can influence it is diet. Some of you may have seen this image in the past. This is actually from the LEAP study that I'm going to talk a little bit more about, but this is the dual exposure hypothesis. And as I mentioned, when I was talking about the immune system, you know, we know that there is significant immune activity in the skin and there's significant immune activity in the gut. And when it comes to sensitization or development of allergies, for many babies, it starts with the skin. Our skin is our, our protection from the environment, right? It lets things in, it lets things out. Um, but if the skin is broken, then things can get in through the skin that shouldn't be coming in through the skin, right? And that can include proteins because there are proteins all in our environment, in the dust, in our homes, in our beds. And um, that protein can actually cause an immune response when the skin is broken, as in the case of, of eczema. So what we've learned is that through oral exposure, the immune system that might have been sensitized through the skin becomes trained or tolerized. But when the proteins are not introduced through the gut, when there's not oral exposure, that sensitization through the skin is more likely to go on than to develop into true food allergy. So this is the first study that I wanna just mention. This, there was a study that was done in the 90s, um, in the late 90s and then published in the early 2000s um, that, that showed that babies who were in Israel were 10 times less likely to develop a peanut allergy than genetically similar babies in the UK. In the UK, they had similar, um, sil similar to the US, they recommended that peanuts not be served to babies in the first year. They were very um, conservative about how they fed babies. But in Israel, there was this food called bomba that you see here in this picture that was a weaning food that many, many families ate and um, many, many mothers gave to their babies. So this was one of the first foods that babies would be, be given as a weaning food. They would chew on it. They had it all the time. It was in their homes. Everyone in the family um, oftentimes ate it. And they thought maybe this is one of the things that was, um, that was contributing to this tolerance versus the development of food allergies. But of course, being scientists, they had to figure that out. And so they conducted a study called learning early about peanut allergy, often called the LEAP study. And in the LEAP study, what they did was they recruited babies, uh, where they recruited families, including infants, who were at high risk for developing a peanut allergy, either because they had egg allergy already, or they had moderate to severe eczema. They randomized these babies to two groups where they either started eating peanut foods when they, became, when they were enrolled in the study between four and 11 months, or they avoided peanut foods. And they followed these babies for five years. And what they found at the end of the five years was that in the babies who ate peanut foods early, there was up to an 86% reduction in the risk of developing a peanut allergy. So what they found was that early introduction was both safe and effective in reducing the risk of peanut allergies. So that was in high risk babies, of course. What about other babies? That's the natural next question. And these researchers did another study called the EAT study, inquiring about tolerance, where they recruited babies who were not at high risk, who didn't have any known risk. They were breastfed. And they, they recruited these babies to start eating um, these six allergens you see here, milk, egg, peanut, wheat, sesame and fish, because sesame is a more common allergy in Europe. 
And they started at three months to introduce these foods. And they either, they just randomized um, which one they would start first. So they started one of these foods and then they added the next and the next, starting at about three months. And then um, what they found was at the end of the study, it was, it was difficult for parents to adhere to this protocol. So not really that surprising for those of us who know a lot about feeding babies, it could be difficult to get all of these foods in as quickly as they were needed and in the quantities that, that was necessary in order to meet the protocol for the study. But even with that said, in the babies that began eating allergens early as compared to the ones who didn't, they did see an overall decrease in food allergies. And in, in the specific cases of peanut and egg, when those foods were eaten at the two gram per week goal in the baby's diet, there was a decrease in peanut and egg allergies. And remember, this isn't a, no, this isn't a no known risk population, right? So these are in babies that, that didn't have any known risk for developing food allergies. The last study that I want to, or this next to the last study I want to mention to you is called the Child Study. This is a study out of Canada that's more of a population-wide study. And what they did in this study was they followed about 2,600 babies from birth through three years. And every six months, they had the families come in and they, they filled out a questionnaire and they did some sensitization testing. So they did a blood or skin test. I can't remember off the top of my head, but they did the, either a blood or a skin test to determine if they had developed sensitization, which may not necessarily have meant allergy, but certainly meant that something was going on immunologically, right? Um, and they did a questionnaire about how they were feeding the baby. And what they found was that in those who introduced peanut foods uh, by 12 months or after 12 months, rather, after 12 months, if they waited until 12 months or longer, they had a, a twofold increase of peanut allergy. If they waited 18 months or longer to introduce peanut foods, they had a sevenfold increased risk of peanut allergy. So I think that's, again, you know, it's an observational study in the population, not cause and effect necessarily, but it's definitely telling us something about patterns of eating and how that influences the development of food allergies. The last study that I want to mention is called the Petit Trial, and in this study they actually um, did a two-step or a stepwise introduction of egg to children who are at high risk, so babies who are at high risk for developing an egg allergy based on the fact that they had severe eczema. And they used heated egg white powder in a very small dose and then they increased it to a larger dose. And they actually found in this protocol that it was so effective at reducing egg allergy that they stopped the study early. And again, you know, this was a high risk population and a very um, clinical kind of way of introducing. But what it shows us is that these proteins, getting them into the baby's diet early is very effective at helping reduce the risk and even preventing allergy. So let's stay, take a step back a little bit and look again at the history of feeding. So when we think about feeding infants, you know, things have changed a lot in the last 20 years, right? It, I mean, things have really, we've almost done a 180. In 2000, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended avoiding the top allergens for one, two, or three years, depending on the allergen, right? But in 2008, they actually came out with guidance that said the research doesn't support avoidance to prevent food allergies. We need more information. They didn't necessarily say proactively feed your baby, but they did. They no longer recommended avoidance as the standard. But I think most people will agree that that continued to be the general recommendation and guidance for the future until the LEAP study was published. In 2010, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease released their guidance that again supported the idea that we didn't have enough research to say that avoidance was what we should be doing, but they didn't recommend um, actually introducing foods, allergens in particular, until 2015 when the LEAP study came out. And then after the LEAP study, the NIAID published new guidelines that recommended peanut foods be introduced to babies early. In 2017, that document was published. And then finally in 2019, the AAP made their revision in their guidance that suggested that we do need to be feeding peanut foods early in order to prevent food allergies or prevent peanut allergies. Well, the, the NIAID guidelines are here. So you can see this is what the NIAID guidelines came out with. And essentially it's the LEAP study. It's, it's actually implementing the LEAP study at a population level. And you can see group one is this high risk infant, the infant who has egg allergy or has severe to moderate eczema. Um, these kids only are recommended to talk to the pediatrician first. So if you have a baby who has these, these situ this situation, then the recommendation right now is still to talk to the pediatrician first.
But um, in general, these are the babies that benefit the most based on the LEAP study by this early introduction. So the conversation needs to happen early if a baby has severe eczema or if they're showing some atopy, some problems with food, we need to start having those conversations very early. They may need to have a skin test in advance, depending on what that shows, they may want to even have that first oral feeding happen in the doctor's office. The recommendation for this group is to start as early as four to six months. So if you, if you have heard that peanut food should be started before six months, this is the group that that probably benefits the most. Because they're at the, the, they're at the highest risk for developing a peanut allergy, they, they may also develop it earlier. The other thing about this group is that the recommendation is a little more prescriptive, right? So it's two grams, per, two grams of peanut protein three times a week. That's about two teaspoons per serving, or per eating episode rather. Then the rest of babies fit into the other two groups. And so I think, you know, what we know is that without these other high risk factors, the risk is pretty low that babies are going to develop a peanut allergy, but it's not zero. So we wanna reduce the risk in all infants. That's why early introduction is recommended for all babies. So in group two, we're talking about babies who might have mild eczema. It's not necessary to see the pediatrician first, but some people choose to. And then group three, um, this is no known risk. In both of these groups, the recommendation is to start peanut foods at around six months, introducing at home. Pretty straightforward. And then this is just a little bit more about the AAP's guidance. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, except for to say that AAP supports what NIAID says, which supports what the LEAP study showed. So now here we are today, right? So today we're looking at how can we make this a more population-wide approach? Because we've gone from these clinical guidelines based on very clinical um, uh, recommendations to how do we prevent food allergies in the whole population? Because what we know is that only about 20% of babies are gonna have eczema and a very small percentage of those are gonna have severe eczema. Um, very few babies are going to have egg allergy. And if we only focus on those babies, we're not gonna prevent all of the, the potential allergy, allergies. But if we focus on the whole popula population, we have the potential to really impact the next generation to prevent food allergies. Enter the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. So as some of you may know, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans is released every five years, and these were released at the end of December. This is our new guidelines, our new national guidelines on how we should eat. And for the first time, they actually introduce recommendations for infants and toddlers. And it's exciting because we haven't had these guidelines in the past. And even more exciting is that these new guidelines address allergen introduction. And here's what the dietary guidelines say about introducing allergens. And again, think about this as a, a whole population. This is all babies. We're talking about the majority of babies. Potentially allergenic food should be introduced when other complementary foods are introduced. So basically, when you start feeding a baby solid foods and they're showing some, some interest and some benefit and they're not showing any reactions, then you should start introducing these um, potential allergens in order to reduce the risk. And specifically, peanuts are called out because there is the most research. And sometimes I get questions questions about what about other allergens? What about other allergens? We have a lot less research on all of the other foods. That's why there's a lot of focus on peanut is because we have a lot of research on peanut and we know that early introduction of peanut helps reduce the risk of peanut allergy. We have similar research and growing research on egg. It's not quite as strong as peanut, but we have a lot of good research now um, that helps support egg introduction. And again, for that high risk infant, the ones that I mentioned, severe eczema and already having egg allergy, these are the kids that we wanna make sure that we're getting peanut foods in earliest. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-presenter, the lovely Mal Melina Malkani, and I'm gonna ask also for Kelly to launch our next poll question. I know that you guys have a lot of questions. I've kind of been seeing them pop up. We're gonna to come to those. Okay, I think my screen is sharing now. Um, so this is a great poll and I'm gonna address this a little bit in my talk, but um, the percentage of pediatricians who are aware of those 2017 addendum guidelines for the prevention of peanut allergies and who are fully implementing them, um, if you've answered less than one third, then you are correct. Um, thank, and thank you for 
uh, answering those. And thank you, Sherry. I could listen to you speak all day. Um, I, I always learn so much um, every time I hear you speak. Um, but I'm gonna jump in right away because I have a lot to cover. Um, in my work, I see so much anxiety among parents and caregivers about introducing the top allergens during infancy, but also just starting solids in general. And that fear can really be a barrier to um, introducing the top allergens. And as dietitians, we have such an opportunity to help reduce some of the parental stress around infant feeding so that people are more likely to feed their babies in such a way that that likelihood of food allergies is reduced. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of the different options for starting solids, which these days there's a few. Uh, we've got the traditional approach, which involves um, the passive spoon feeding of purees, and then baby led weaning, which off involves offering baby appropriately sized and textured finger foods from the family table for self feeding, starting at about six months of age when the signs of readiness are present. And then a combined approach, which includes both. And by the way, there is no evidence that a combined approach is detrimental. Um, somewhere between seven and 12 months, the general goal is for all babies to be self-feeding finger foods anyway. And it really, it's, it's a personal decision. Um, it, it comes down to how parents choose to feed and what they're comfortable with and what works best for them and for their babies. But as a dietitian in private practice who works a lot with parents who are navigating those picky eating behaviors in toddlers and children, I just wanna highlight one of the many benefits of baby led weaning because not that I wanna put myself out of business, but there is a, a really growing body of evidence that points to the power of baby led weaning to increase the likelihood of adventurous eating and reduce the likelihood of food venous down the road. Um, one quick misconception that I would like to set straight, um, studies show that when parents are educated on food sizing and texture, baby leg weaning does not increase the likelihood of choking episodes. And in fact, a 2017 study in the Journal of Human Nutrition and Dietetics found that the babies who were offered finger foods the least often had the highest frequency of choking episodes. And this doesn't mean that baby leg weaning is right for every baby at all. But as dietitians, it's just important for us to know that the evidence and the popular opinion here are not in alignment. So at what age should babies start solids? Um, well, again, the guidelines have changed so much over the past several decades and people have really widely and different opinions on this, but we know now that there are risks associated with starting too early and risks associated with starting too late. And at this point, um, these major health organizations and the new dietary guidelines all recommend for most babies starting solids at around six months of age when those signs of readiness for solid foods are present. And from a physiological standpoint, the vast majority of babies don't need solids before about six months. But still, according to the dietary guidelines, 32% of infants are introduced to complementary foods before four months. So we have some work to do in that area to spread awareness. So I'm sure you've heard this uh, saying before, food before one, is it just for fun? Well, it is fun. It's an incredibly rich, connective and sensory experience, but it's also essential for so many different things, including nutrition, um, because by about six months, those iron stores that babies build up in utero are depleted and they need to start getting iron from food sources, which as we all know, is essential for the development of the brain and the immune system for overall growth. Um, in the US, however, it's estimated that 77% of breastfed babies have inadequate iron intake during the second half of infancy. So again, we have, we have work to do there as well. But food before one is also really uh, impor important for the progression of those gross and fine motor skills associated with feeding, like building trunk stability and those head and neck muscles that are needed to support upright sitting and the fine motor skills associated with picking up a piece of food and bringing it up to the mouth and developing the muscles associated with chewing and swallowing and, and moving food around in the mouth. There's so many important uh, pieces to that. And then Food before one also helps build a baby's palate and accepting of a wide variety of foods and textures. And it's, I, I think, it's fascinating. On average, a baby's birth weight triples during the first year of life. That growth is just exponential. And their palates are arguably the most open and accepting that they'll ever be. So, so this is the time to really offer a wide variety of 
flavors and textures and different foods so that by the time they hit toddlerhood and that growth and appetite both slow down somewhat and those those picky eating phases start creeping in, which is developmentally quite normal, but can be really tricky to navigate. Um, if a baby is already eating, you know, say 10 green vegetables and decides he or she doesn't want like broccoli, then it's fine because there's nine other green vegetables that he or she already accepts. Um, but last but not least, food before one is also critical for the prevention of food allergies, which is why we're here. So what do we do with all this new information? Um, well, we shift our priorities a little bit. We help caregivers get strategic about the foods offered during infancy with an eye toward that nutrient density and maximizing the nutrition in every bite, optimizing the absorption of those nutrients as best we can, including top allergens in the baby's diet early and then often as well. That's a really important piece focusing on diet diversification, not just as a way to possibly reduce the likelihood of food allergies, but also to help encourage that adventurous eating. Um, we also help care, uh, caregivers focus on that infant safe food prep. And I'll get into specifics on that in a minute. Educating ourselves and our clients on which nutrients to avoid and which ones to limit during infancy, like added sugars and honey and excess sodium. And then educating ourselves and our clients on the differences between gagging and choking and what to do in the event of each. And this by far is the biggest source of stress in parents that I see when it comes to starting solids. And education is really the best defense against both the danger of choking and also the fear of it. Um, just as a quick refresher, I know you guys probably know this really well, but gagging is a very normal and noisy, important part of learning how to eat. And it can sound alarming and look alarming, um, but it's actually really helpful. And it's that built-in safety mechanism that allows infants to bring forward food that they're not quite ready yet to swallow. Whereas choking on the other hand is a silent event that happens when a piece of, of food occludes the airway and no air can pass through. And it is important for all caregivers of infants just to be certified in infant first aid and CPR. And that certification is really easy to do and it's affordable these days online. So now that we kind of know what the new priorities are in terms of infant feeding, how do we breathe life into them and make them actionable for our clients? Well, according to the Baby-Led Introduction to Solids or the BLISS study, offering balanced baby meals help ensure that baby's getting the nutrients that he or she needs to thrive and grow. And these would an iron-rich protein food, a fruit or a vegetable that's preferably high in vitamin C, and this may help boost that iron absorption, which is so important, and an energy-rich food, preferably high in healthy fats. And as far as portions go, if baby led weaning, I'd like to recommend starting with three to four pieces of food, not so many that it's intimidating for the baby, not so few that it's boring. Um, if spoon feeding, it's reasonable to expect that a baby may consume about one tablespoon of each food offered. So it's fine to start there. And then if baby wants more, it's fine to offer more. But the key is to let baby lead because the truth is babies are really amazing at self-regulating and meeting their nutrient needs when we feed them responsibly, offering a wide variety of nutritious foods and then letting them decide whether and how much to eat. And by responsive feeding, I mean, learning a baby's unique cues for hunger and fullness, which can look different from baby to baby, and then responding to them right away. Um, the good news is that during that first year of life, breast milk and or formula is gonna be the number one source of nutrients anyway. So it's like a, a nice insurance policy that can give clients the confidence that baby's getting the nutrients needed to thrive and grow while those feeding skills are developing. In terms of food sizing, it is a misconception that food sizing depends on the baby's age and number of teeth. Um, how we size their foods in terms of finger foods actually depends on the type of grasp they're using and how they're picking up pieces of food. Usually at about six months, most babies are using a palmer grasp to pick up pieces of food and palm them up to the mouth. And at this stage, we wanna offer finger sized and shaped pieces of foods or larger. Um, and you can think like a stick of sweet potato or a wedge of ripe avocado, or even a, a mango pit that has had some of the flesh removed, but still has some on there that they can just kind of munch. Um, 
once a baby gets to about usually around nine months of age, although every baby is on his or her own timeline and develops at his or her own rate, most babies are using a pincer grasp, which means it's time to start offering small bites of food cut to about the size of a chickpea. Regardless of whether foods uh, are, are, are offered in the stick shape or the chickpea size, they should be very soft and so squishy that they can kind of smash between your thumb and your forefinger. And this makes the foods much more manageable in the baby's mouth and reduces choking risk. So here are those top nine allergenic foods as well as sesame. Um, these are all cotton, nutrient dense, minimally processed foods. And we now know that we want to encourage caregivers to start introducing these foods early and often starting at about six months of age, but how should they begin? Well, first, um, I like to advise clients to start by offering babies a few of the non-top allergenic foods, a few veggies, a few fruits, maybe some oats, maybe a few meats, and just establish that feeding is going okay first. Then it's best as parents start offering the top allergens to do so in the morning on a day when they can be fully attentive for at least two hours, since most allergic reactions occur within just a few minutes to a couple of hours after the food was eaten. Best to do this on a weekday. It just makes the pediatrician that much easier to reach their guidance be needed. And it's also important to start with a healthy, happy baby so that in the event of any reaction, we're not mistaking say a virus or teething uh, with a potential allergic reaction. Offer the top allergen alone or as a part of a meal that includes foods the baby has had and tolerated a few times before, so that if there is reaction, we can figure out which food is responsible. And then just offer a tiny bit to start. And if no reaction, increase the amount, feed it again the next day and again the next. And that's usually enough to establish that a food is well tolerated. And then making sure that it stays in baby's diet regularly is a really important piece of this process as well. And then moving on to the next top allergen. I also, I always get questions about single food introductions of the non-top allergens. You know, are we, are we still doing that? And in general, most people agree at this point that once a good number of foods have been introduced, single food introductions of those non-top allergenic foods are not necessary. So eggs are usually recommended as the best top allergen with which to begin. And in general, they're a great nutrient dense first food for babies anyway. Um, the, the texture of eggs lends itself really well to infant feeding because eggs can be prepared in a way that they're, they're very soft. Um, one egg provides all the choline babies and toddlers need in an entire day, which is amazing. Natural food source of vitamin D, high quality protein. This is stuff you guys all know. Um, but there's lots of confusion about whether both the whites and the yolks should be introduced during infancy because pediatricians used to recommend avoiding the egg whites until after 12 months. And we know now that it's important for both the white and the yolk to be introduced early and often during infancy. Um, and here's a slide on peanuts. Again, a nutrient dense recommended early food for babies. Um, but it, they do need to be modified because whole peanuts and globs of peanut butter are choking hazards. Um, so it's so easy to um, just thin some smooth peanut butter with a little bit of breast milk or formula or applesauce, even water, um, or to create a thin paste using peanut powder and any of the liquids I just mentioned. Um, and there's also like, like the Bomba Puffs, a lot of infant friendly meltable peanut puffs. Um, these, the Bomba ones are pictured here, but these can all soaked and softened in a little bit of breast milk or formula or water to make them easier to swallow for a younger baby. And for babies six months and up who are eating finger foods, it's fine to spread a, a thin layer of peanut butter on a finger of toast or a teething cracker. In case you have clients with those high risk infants for whom early introduction of peanut between four and six months is recommended, who might be nervous that introducing peanut early could have some negative effects, it's important to note that offering peanut early does not affect the duration of breastfeeding, nor does it negatively affect growth or nutrition. And this is per a 2016 study in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, which is cited on this slide if you're interested. Um, now let's see, so in terms of cow's milk, there's lots of confusion here as well on cow's milk can and should be offered during infancy because it's not recommended as a beverage before the age of one for multiple reasons, including that in larger amounts, it can inhibit in uh, iron absorption, but it can also end up replacing breast milk and or formula in baby's diet, which is obviously not ideal. 
but cow's milk can and should be offered in foods and baked goods and recipes. And some of the great ways to, uh, to introduce it include making oatmeal or a chia seed pudding with it, or baking it into muffins or pancakes. Um, plain full fat yogurt is another great option. Um, I like telling clients to look for those live active, uh, live active cures seals, which indicate the presence of probiotics. Um, cheese is another great option, but two things to keep in mind for baby. One, it's important to choose types of cheese that are made um, with pasteurized milk as opposed to unpasteurized milk. And then some cheeses can be higher in sodium than is ideal for babies. So here are some of my favorite cheeses that work well for babies. Um, that are softer in texture, like mozzarella and ricotta. Um, and you can help your clients get creative. Um, for example, taking something like a teething cracker that a lot of parents love, but might not be the most nutrient dense choice. And then spreading on a thin layer of mascarpone cheese or creme fraiche or, or peanut butter to help boost the, the nutrition and then build those top allergens into the diet. Um, soy is an excellent source of, of iron and calcium and zinc. I love blending silken tofu into purees for babies um, or cutting firm tofu into fingers or chickpea size bites. You can serve it uncooked, baked, roasted, or whatever works best. Tempe is another option for serving soy. Best if it's steamed so it's a lot softer and squishier. Uh, smashed edamame is another great option. And for younger babies, I do recommend removing the skin. Um, plain unsweetened soy yogurt, and then plain unsweetened soy milk is great for use in oatmeal or pancake batter or other recipes. Um, I just like to emphasize that like cow's milk, it should not be served as a beverage before the age of one. And here are some practical ways to serve fish. Uh, many types of fish can be a great source of iron and protein and brain building omega-3s. Um, before serving to babies, we want to teach clients to just make sure it's cooked thoroughly and all the bones are removed. Um, and if they're shopping for canned fish, to choose those low salt or no salt added and BPA free versions. If choosing fresh, um, it's important for them to choose the small prey fish that have lower mercury levels. And some of my favorites that are the highest in omega 3s and the lowest in mercury include sardines, which a lot of babies love. Salmon, particularly the wild caught Alaskan salmon, haddock, pollock, and cod. Um, and it's really easy to mix mashed fish with some avocado or yogurt or mayonnaise for, you know, for scooping with hands. Um, or it works well as well, cooked into patties or fritters or just even served as tender pieces of uh, flaked uh, fish, as you can see here. With regard to shellfish, the texture of shellfish does tend to be rubbery and tough, which increases choking risk. So it does need to be modified and shredding it or finally chopping it and then adding it to fritters and sauces and patties um, or something like a crab cake tends to work really well. But another problem with most types of shellfish is that they're naturally high in sodium. And it's important to limit the excess sodium in baby's diet before the age of one for a lot of reasons, including that excessive exposure to salt during infancy may increase the risk of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and obesity down the road. And the truth is whether early intro of shellfish specifically reduces the risk of food allergy is, is not yet too well researched, but we don't have evidence that we should avoid it either during infancy and current guidelines indicate that all potentially allergenic foods can be introduced to infants in the first year in safe form. So bottom line, if it's already a part of a family's diet, by all means, work it into the baby's diet as well in an infant safe form, just being mindful about safe serve and about the sodium content in the rest of what is offered to the baby throughout that day and even in the context of a week. Um, and if it's not already a part of a family's diet, just know that early intro of shellfish is, is not as much of a priority as foods like peanut and egg. With regard to tree nuts, again, whole nuts and globs of nut butter are also a choking hazard, but we can serve this safely by spreading a thin layer of smooth nut butter on a toast strip or a teething cracker. Um, I also love um, adding nut flours or ground nuts into muffins and pancakes or breads. And one of my absolute favorite ways to introduce nuts is to roll a slippery wedge of in ground nuts for better grip for the baby, as well as a nutrient boost and an introduction to a top allergen. Um, and those ground nuts also work well, sprinkled on cooked vegetables or stirred into a puree like yogurt or applesauce. 
With regard to wheat, um, as with all the top allergens, start small with wheat, introduce it in small quantities and increase the amount served over time. Some infant friendly ways to offer include pancake, they're nice and squishy, lightly toasted bread strips, waffles, French toast. Um, I love whole wheat or kamut pasta. And then uh, if you're going the puree route, wheat germ works really well mixed into a puree or even wheat bran. Um, and it also adds extra grip on those slippery food wedges. And then here's some infant friendly ways to serve sesame. Again, sesame is now the ninth most common allergen or al food allergy in the US. Um, tahini, which is that wonderful ground sesame paste can be spread on toast strips or teething crackers. I really love blending tahini into the broth of a low sodium soup or stew. It makes it really creamy and rich um, and it works great for babies on a preloaded spoon. Um, and then homemade hummus on toast strips again, or even on a spoon is another great way to introduce sesame. So the baby food aisle has changed a lot in response to this research, which is wonderful. And of course, parents and caregivers can absolutely modify foods from scratch to introduce all these top allergens. Um, and it's really easy and simple to do so. But for those who are looking for convenience and some, more, some sort of portable and on the go puree products, there's lots of options. Um, the Happy Family Organic Nutty Blends, pureed baby food pouches, these contain peanuts and tree nuts. Um, Square Baby is a, a baby food delivery subscription service and it delivers frozen purees, many of which include pureed peanut. Um, My Peanut, again, pureed baby food pouches with peanut and then Inspired Start is another pureed baby food subscription delivery service and these can come in individual box or by subscription. And then um, these products are really helpful once you've introduced peanut in helping parents keep peanut in the diet often. Um, Bamba, again, is that original peanut puff. And then Mission Mighty Me, I don't know if you've seen these, they're so wonderful. These tiny little star-shaped organic peanut puffs that are perfect for when babies using a pincer grasp and they're really yummy. Um, the Gerber Baby Pops, another puffed peanut meltable snack. Uh, the Earth Earth's best ones are better for to toddlers ages two and up. Um, Puff Works Baby is good for the Palmer Grass babies uh, the, uh, because of the way they're shaped. And then the Plum Organics um, is a great option for toddlers ages 15 months and up. And then for those who are looking for an overall more prescribed approach to the early introduction of top allergens, using allergen powders, there's uh, a few different options available. Little Mixins offers pre-measured allergen powders, and these are sold either in tubs or on these little on-the-go individual packets. And they have baked egg, tree nut, which involves pistachio, almonds, walnuts, and hazelnuts all in one packet, which makes keeping all the different nuts or, or four, at least four of the different nuts in baby's diet much easier to do. And then they also have a peanut powder. Ready Set Food um, are, again, pre-measured individual packets of allergen powders, but these are for milk, egg, and peanut protein. And these are designed to be introduced in a stepwise order, uh, starting first with milk, then egg, and then peanut. And then Spoonful One is a system of allergen introduction. This is designed to be administered over the course of a year, starting as early as four months. And these products, they have powders and puffs and crackers. Um, these each contain 16 allergenic food proteins um, in all the products. So some key takeaway here, um, to help your clients find the joy in feeding their babies and help them to be confident and to feed responsibly. This just helps make the entire process go so much more positive, positively for everybody and just helps reduce so much of that stress and fear associated with feeding. And I think it really helps for them to hear from us that every meal is not gonna go perfectly every time and that's okay. And babies are learning, there's so many goals, they're learning so much from each eating experience and they're gonna get something out of it even if not much of the food gets ingested <laughs> at that meal. Um, and we can really help our caregivers understand that meal prep for babies can be so simple and that with minor modifications, babies, babies can eat what the family eats and that introducing top allergens early and often can and should be a part of that process. So I will invite Sherry to come back for a little bit of q and I think we have some time for that. And it's been such a pleasure to present for you today. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, this, this has been fantastic. And thank you everyone who's been submitting questions. 
Um, just a friendly reminder that we are recording this and we will share the slides and recording and certificate with you within one week. Um, so keep an eye out for an email from us at Old Ways. Um, so if you'd like, we can just dive in. Um, we had an interesting question come in. We often hear allergies manifest in terms of an immune response, but it was mentioned that sometimes nausea and vomiting may be a symptom as well. In this case, is it best to do a blood test to determine if it's a food allergy versus a food intolerance? So that's a great question. And I think that, you know, food allergy diagnosis is a bit of an art as much as it is a science. I think that the thing to remember is that typically um, food allergy reactions shouldn't be the first thought, right? So if the symptoms are rather mild, it shouldn't be the first thing we think of, right? We shouldn't immediately assume that it's a food allergy. If someone's having a severe reaction, absolutely, we need to think about a food allergy right away. It could be a very severe reaction. But if someone's having rel relatively mild reaction and they have it only one time, I would say that it's not necessary to move immediately into that. Um, I would also say that it really depends on the clinician, right? So we need to work carefully with a pediatrician, with an allergist to help um, figure those things out. If there's the thought that there could be a food allergy, a true food allergy, an IgE-mediated food allergy, whatever the symptoms are, then blood and skin testing should be part of the diagnostic process, but alone they aren't enough to diagnose food allergies. So I think bringing that symptom history together with clini clinical laboratory results and the clinician's um, expert opinion, that's how we get to the best possible diagnosis of a food allergy and how we tease out other kinds of reactions as well as intolerances. Great, thank you. Um, Melina, we have a question here. Uh, do you have recommendations of how to time breastfeeding and formula feeding with complementary foods and how to find that balance throughout the day? That is such a good question. And it really does depend on the baby. Um, it does, I do find that um, when it comes to complementary foods, it's good to start with a baby who especially um, is not too hungry and then also not too full um, because usually then the, the feeds don't, the, the meals don't go as well. If a baby is, is really, really hungry and upset and can't self-feed fast enough, that can just be a really frustrating and negative feeding experience. So it kind of takes a little bit of trial and error to figure that out. Um, so there really isn't a blanket answer <laughs> that works, but yes, um, Sort of interweaving the milk feeds and the and the the complementary food feeds with enough time in between so baby can have a little bit of hunger before coming to the meal. That's great. Thank you so much. And then I think you both touched on this a little, but just going over again, how many days should you wait between each new allergenic food before you introduce the next one? You want, you want to take, take that? that, you want to take that? <laughs> you actually answered it in the presentation. You know, I think that yeah. I think that it it depends on the baby. I mean, I, in general, once you've started introducing allergens and you're finding that there's not any you know, concern, the baby's not showing any issues, you can wait less amount of time. I would say one allergen per day for sure. And in the case when you're first starting to introduce them, you wanna wait a couple of days or even three days. Introducing, making sure you're introducing it every day, those three days in a row that you're feeding, for instance, peanut, if you start, you know, if you're giving peanut, give it the first day early as Melina described, and then give it again the second day, give it again the third day. By the third day, if there's no reaction, there's probably not gonna be a reaction and you should be able to move forward incorporating that into the diet um, comfortably. And then with each subsequent allergen, the new allergen, maybe do it, you know, for at least two days. Um, you may not need to do it three times in a row. Maybe two times is enough. It just really depends on the baby. Would you agree with that, Melina? Yeah, I would. I would. And I think, um, you know, sometimes if there's going to be an, uh, an, a reaction, it's not going to happen on that first uh, ingestion of the food. So it does, it's helpful to have a couple of days of introducing it, not just one introduction and then leave it, but uh, offering it one day and then the next and then the next, and then you can kind of be confident. Yeah, and also I would just give a shout out for the, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease addendum guidelines for introducing peanut have really good clear how to introduce peanut foods at home um, with, you know, just like the, the, the very basic guidance on how to do it. And I think it, it's a good tool to use for any food. Thank you. 
Um, we have another question here about um, if there are specific or different guidelines for introducing allergens to infants who are on a hypoallergenic formula, um, such as Alimentum, Nutramigen, and Elacare. Yeah, so I would say it's important to work with the pediatrician. You know, if the baby's showing some signs of allergy, they may actually benefit most from early introduction because they're showing that predisposition toward allergy, which is what the LEAP study really was all about, right? Can that early intervention really prevent allergy from developing? But I would say that because the baby's already showing some predisposition, it's especially important to work with the pediatrician because they may want to do some allergy testing. They may want to do the allergy, they may want to do the first introduction in the office. Um, they may not want to do any of that. And I think it's going to be very much a case by case basis. All right. Well, thank you both so much for your time today. Did you have a slide where people can follow you on social media or? Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, and I want to also say thank you to the National Peanut Board uh, for bringing this to our audience. So with that, I will say goodbye and we hope you join us at a future webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.